the Lord. And so, um, so uh, it's a little challenging for me to be here on Mother's Day and talking about the, the message is going to talk here about mothers. So just bear with me if you'll understand and, and be patient with me if I get to any point and uh, lose it a little bit. That's, that's why. But I really wanted to be here uh, with you this morning and was excited for the opportunity couple several weeks ago had breakfast with Lee and Jim, and they told me, kind of gave me a little window into where you guys are at as a church. And so I was really excited for the opportunity to talk to you because of where you are right now in in your season of life. Uh, Just an incredible opportunity. I don't know if you realize the opportunity that you have in front of you. I mean, you sit right here on 16. Uh, you have people passing all, all the time. You have communities across the street. You have just a lot of opportunity to, to reach out into the community. And it sounds like, from, from what Jim and Lee are telling me, you guys are just well positioned, even mentally, emotionally. You're just, you're ready to reach out into your community. And so I, I'm really excited for the opportunity to speak into that uh, this morning, it sounds like, and, and if, if I misunderstand, if, if you listen to anything I'm, I'm saying here about where Calvary is at and I'm wrong about it or whatever, you blame that on me and don't blame that on Jim because I probably heard it wrong. But my understanding is that you guys, I know you, you guys have come through a season, a couple of difficult things, um, you know, pastoral changes and those kind of things. And so now you find yourself in a season of saying, who are we? Where do we go as we move into the future? And my understanding is you're kind of redefining what we want to be about. And, that, and, and really, my understanding, this is how I would capsulize it. Again, forgive me if, if I'm mischaracterizing this. But I would characterize it as you're moving from a, a long, solid history of Bible learning, which is fantastic, but moving into a season of saying, let's do Bible living. And not that you didn't do Bible living before, but just the emphasis, where's the emphasis? And we're not leaving out the Bible learning. That's the, that's the foundation, understanding what did God call us to and how is he calling us to live. But it's really moving into more of an emphasis of how do we live that out? What is discipleship? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And so along with that, saying how do we expand that into our community? How do we reach these families? across the road here? How do we reach families, people who are hungry to grow in Christ, to know Christ, and to grow in him? How do we reach those people? And what an exciting thing to be, because that's right in the center of God's will. Jesus, what was the last thing he said? He said to go and make disciples. So if you're going to be about making disciples, you're right in the center of his will. And so what I want to talk to you this morning about is is really a tie-in with Mother's Day in how do we help people grow spiritually because there's a lot of parallels between how we help people grow spiritually and how we help people grow physically. So we all have some familiarity with the, the work that a mother does. Either you've done it yourself as a mother or you've had one. Maybe not a biological mother. Maybe a biological mother didn't raise you. Maybe it was even a dad, a surrogate mother as a dad or an aunt or a grandmother. But somebody played that role of being a, a mother in your life. And they did, did the work of, of you know, feeding you, comforting you when you're sad, changing those diapers, maybe the least popular, least favorite kind of thing that, that mothers have to do. I, I was read that a study was done a number of of years ago to look at how much work mothers do compared to someone who does not have uh, children. So it says women who never have children enjoy the equivalent of an extra three months a year in leisure time. Okay, that's what this study showed. And if that figure seems high, then they kind of broke it down. They said, remember, the average mother spends three and a half more hours a week doing housework than would a woman without children, plus 11 hours a week on child-related activities. That all adds up to an additional 754 hours of work every year, and that's the equivalent of three months of 12-hour, five-day work weeks. Okay, so hats off to moms. I know some of you may be here this morning. There may be some some ladies here who say, man, I wish I had that. Now, I know that's a reality for some ladies. They wish they could have those children. So, but this morning, we want to focus on and just think about who was that mom in your life who did that work, who took those three months 
out of her year to say, I'm going to raise you and, and get you strong and get you to the point where you, where you are now. That's who we want to honor today. So, you know, some people say Hallmark invented this holiday just so they could make some money. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But if, if they didn't invent it, somebody else should have. It should be here. We should have a day to, to honor mom. So be sure you honor your mom for the work that she, she's done for you over the years. The role of mother is so significant that Paul used this as, as a metaphor to say this is what it's like to disciple people. This is what discipleship looks like. All the care, all the work, all the effort that a human mother puts into a child. Paul says, Paul said to one of the churches, we're going to read this in a few minutes. He said to one of his churches, we became like a mother to you. We became like that to you because we made that effort, we made that investment in you. So what, what I want to do in the next couple of minutes here this morning is really unpack that metaphor of, of motherhood and discipleship and how that ties together. Because what's going to happen, what is happening for you now and what's going to happen over the months to come is that God is going to bring people through your doors and you're going to have the opportunity to nurture them, to, to disciple them, to help them grow in Christ. And so what we want to do is look at moms and say, can, can we learn anything from moms to be ready so that we know what to do with these folks when they come in? So if you would, if you'd turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me. And as you're turning there, I want to just give you a little bit of backstory to Thessalonians so that we understand what Paul, where this, these verses fall in context here. The backstory, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians. Paul really only spent a few weeks in Thessalonica the first time he was there. He was moving through on his first missionary journey, and he went there, he preached in the synagogues, and he talked with people during the week. So he was only there three weeks before the jealous Jewish people who were there drove him out because they did not like the fact that people were responding to this new message that he was bringing, this message about Jesus. And so they didn't like that. They drove him out. They drove him to Berea. They didn't like him so much that the people from Thessalonica followed him to Berea, drove him out from there as well. So he didn't have very much time in Thessalonica, but he was there long enough that there were some people who responded to the message, who responded to the good news about Jesus. He was there long enough that there was, there was a solid church that got planted there. There were people who responded. And so Paul had moved on by now. He was planting other churches, but he got a report from Timothy that it said that the church in Thessalonica is doing really well. And so Paul writes to them to say, here's some more information that you need. Here's some more discipleship. I want to I speak, continue to speak in your life. And that's where we get this letter. So that's kind of the background on that. And so with that, let me just pray and ask the Lord to open our hearts and, and hear what he has to say to us this morning. <coughs> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for pre preserving these very personal letters down over thousands of years. And, and so we thank you for Paul's example and just what we can learn from him this morning. And I, I want to pray specifically for Calvary Bible Church here and the, the incredible opportunity that they have to, to reach people for you and to grow them up in you. And I pray that you would open our hearts to hear from you this morning. Lord, Lord, you know what I have to say is not what they need to hear, but what you have to say to them is what they need to hear. So I pray that their hearts would be open and that you might use my imperfect words to communicate your perfect truth. And may your spirit use it to, to grow them and to prepare them for the work that you have ahead. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's really loud when it's mic'd, isn't it? Sorry about that. Paul is writing to this group of people as a spiritual parent. He's the one that came into Thessalonica, shared the good news about Jesus. And so I want you to listen. We're going to start in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 2. And I want you to listen for the parenting references, the mothering references that he has. And I'm going to ask you to help me out a little bit. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I know some of you may be in King James because that's what's there in the seats. Whatever version you're in, I'm going to pause a couple 
couple times and ask you to help me fill in some blanks here. Make sure that you're staying with me and listening uh, for, for these phrases here. So we're starting in verse 7. Paul says, we were gentle among you like a, what? Like a nursing mother. Anybody have something different than nursing mother? Everybody's got a nursing mother. All right, good. We're all on the same page then. Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our what? Our own selves. Our very selves. I want you to remember that phrase because we're going to come back to that and unpack that as well. We're sharing with you, we shared with you our own selves because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day. Does that sound like a mother or what? We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a what? Like a father. Everybody have father? Somebody have something different? Like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul says, we were like a mother and a father to you. We were like a parent to you. We were nurturing. When Paul wants to figure out what's an image that I can use to convey to these people what what we were like discipling, he doesn't go for, we came to you like a repairman trying to fix you. He doesn't say, I came to you like a coach trying to push you, push you to be all you can be. Yeah, man. He doesn't use that. He doesn't say even, I came to you like a doctor trying to heal you. He says we came like a parent. Came like a parent trying to nurture you. That, that was our heart. That's, that's the way we, we came to you. Because Paul knows that spiritual infants need nurture. That's what they need most of all. Go back to chapter 1, verse 9, and he's describing these, these folks. Do you have a cough drop? <clears throat> um, starting, I'm kind of in the middle of, of this verse there. He says, we know how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. This is who Paul is talking about in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a godless city. There were synagogues there, so there was some idea of, of who the true God is. But he said, we came to you, we, many of you turned from idols, from false gods, to the one living and true God. And so that's who we deal with in church world. We're, we're dealing with people who turn from false gods to the true God. Now, the people that we deal with here in 21st century Greencastle may not be going to wooden idols in a little closet in their house. They may not go to wooden idols and put little necklaces on them, flowers, give them food, whatever. They may not have wooden idols, but they have idols. They have idols of wealth, bank accounts, success, another person in their life that they have set on such a pedestal that they get all of their meaning and value from life from this person instead of getting it from the one living and true God. So who we're dealing with in church world, who we're discipling and growing up, are people who are turning from the false gods and say we're going to turn to the living and true God. And what happens at that moment when they turn from those idols to the living true God Jesus used a phrase to describe that. He said you, they are born again. Remember that? Jesus said they're, they're, you're, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And so when someone is, if someone is going to be born again, what is that put, where does that put them on the continuum of growth? They're, in, they're a baby. They're an infant again. What can infants do for themselves? Not a whole lot. They can, they can screech a lot. They, they, that's what infants do, is when something's wrong, they screech. And so one of the challenges of parents is to figure out, what does that screech mean? Does that screech mean, 
I'm hungry. I'm, I'm wet. Please get me a dry diaper. I got indigestion. You know, I've got, you know, my heart's shutting down. I mean, who knows what the screech means, right? It's just a screech. That's all they can do. And so, but that's, that's the challenge of parenting is figuring out how do I meet this infant's need, figure out what it is, and then meet that that's infant's need. And today, more than ever, when we think about people in, in our culture, it's, it's changed very much in the last decades, that, that people in our culture have no, they have no basis of Bible knowledge. And so when people are, are a spiritual infant, they're truly a spiritual infant, they got nothing, they got no basis to go on. So we could bemoan that, we could be sad about that, and it is sad in many ways, but it's also a fantastic opportunity. Because when people come in and they're saying, I'm, I'm hungry, I know I need something, we can say, we know what you need. This is what you need. We have something that will nurture you spiritually and, and grow you up. And Paul knows that nurturing is more than just a spiritual transaction. Okay? And in verse 7, oh, I forgot to tell you this. I want to, I want to tell you this. this here's, here's the point that I want, to, to, want you to take away today. If you're taking notes, here's what you want to write down and take away. The nature of the mature is to nurture. The nature of the mature person is to nurture. That's why Paul uses this imagery of saying, we, we came to you as a parent nurturing you. The nature of the mature is not to yell and criticize at somebody or, or just say, would you get your act cleaned up and then I'll work with you. The nature of the mature, the truly mature person who's further down the road spiritually when they see a spiritual infant who's crying, screeching in their diaper, and, and they don't know what to do for themselves, the truly mature person says, I'm, I'm going to come alongside of you and nurture you. And he paints a picture of what that is. He says, it's not just a transaction that happens. It's not just a religious transaction. He says this in verse 8. He says, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Not only the gospel of God. We're not just sharing with you the gospel of God. We start with that. We must start with that. That is the, the point of transformation, okay? Because we, you and I don't have anything to offer someone that can help them be born again if we don't share with them the gospel, if we don't share with them the good news that Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins because he loved us so much and he triumphed over his death. We, we don't have anything else to share. So that gospel of God is the beginning point. He says, it's not the ending point. We didn't just come to share that with you. We came to share with you our what? Our very selves. Our very selves. And here, here is where it gets difficult. This, because it's easy to do a, a religious transaction. I mean, what we're kind of doing here this morning, what I'm doing coming in and just talking to you for a couple of minutes here and then leaving, that's close to a, re that's a religious transaction. I'm not, I'm not staying with you for weeks and months and, and years to invest in you because that, that's not my call right now. And, and you guys are doing other plans and, and moving forward in, with different things. So, but, but Paul says, we didn't just come and say, I'm going to give you the gospel. We're going to give you my very self. And that's where it gets messy. It's easy for me to come in today and leave. I mean, I don't know what you're going to do with it, if anything, what I talk about. But the, the messy part is when people come through your door and you share your very self. It gets messy and it gets risky. I want to talk about both of those things this morning uh, now because that's what keeps us from nurturing people is because it's messy. Let's talk about messy. Let's look at some of these words that Paul uses that are messy. He says that we are like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. It's, it's messy to take care of somebody else. In verse 9, he talks about our labor and toil. In the Greek, this is talking about distress. It's talking about expending energy beyond the norm. 
It's our labor and our toil. We worked night and day. That's not fun. See, that's not the fun part of mothering. I think, I think girls, when they're growing up and they want, they want to have a baby, I mean, they're just thinking about, oh, aren't they? They're so cute. They're so tiny. They're so, so cute. And they, they're just so cuddly. And they got, you know, little cheeks and all that stuff. And we can dress them up. And they smell good and stuff until they don't smell good anymore. And any of you who have been mothers know that there's a lot of time for your children that they, they don't smell good, they don't sound good, they don't even feel good, and you're just like, man, I, you know, I need a break. Somebody give me a break from, from this. It's messy. It's difficult to be a good mom. There's a young couple that we know who just had their first child. They've been years and years wanting to have their first child. And they're thrilled to death, uh, so excited. And actually, the little child has had some heart issues, has had a surgery already, two surgeries, I believe. <coughs> but um, this mom posted on Facebook uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. It's funny. Now, you can, you can track. If somebody, with some people, they track their whole life on Facebook. You can see it all right there. It's like their journal, their diary. But she put this on Facebook. She said, our child is either, when, when she is not sleeping, or eating, she's crying. She's doing that screeching thing. And, and she, was, she was reaching out and saying, and there's some moms out there who can help me. Because she's like, I'm, I'm doing the research on colic, and I'm not sure that's what it is. And just trying to figure that out. It is hard. And you know, as, if, if you've been a young parent, you know what that's like. It's like, oh, can I please just get one hour of uninterrupted sleep? You know, it's, it's difficult. It's messy. And as people walk through your doors and their spiritual infants, they're going to be messy. They're going to bring messes with them. There are going to be times, if you get close enough, if you start sharing your very self with someone who's coming through the door, there are going to be times where they, they start sharing their struggles with you, and they're going to come back with the same struggle over and over and over again. They're going to need their spiritual diaper changed over and over again. And you're going to be like, have you not got this yet? I mean, when? when, when I mean, we've talked about this. I've, helped you, I've given you some steps to do. I mean, when, when are you going to get this? But the nature of the mature is to say, you know what? I, I recognize where this person's at. I recognize that they need someone to come alongside of them, nurture them, help them move forward, be patient with them. Paul uses a really interesting word there in verse 7. That's why it's translated nursing mother. He he doesn't use the normal Greek word that we see for mother, which is mater. Naturally, that's pretty close to our word for mother. He does not use that word. He uses a totally different word. And the word means a wet nurse. It's It's a substitute mother. In the time of Paul, it was not uncommon for mothers to sometimes hire a wet nurse, hire someone else to nurse their child, especially if you were well off financially. Someone might do that and say, you do this part of this raising of my child. You nurse my child. And that's the word that he uses. So he's saying, we came like a substitute mother among you, but we loved you like our own children. See, sometimes we need a substitute mother. I've got a video that I want to show. If you guys can put that up on the screen. This is a great one for Mother's Day. Take a look at um, some substitute mothers. Sunday is Mother's Day, so we'll end the week with Steve Hartman's nominee for Mother of the Year. Tonight's Assignment America. You can understand why some visitors to the Burlington, Iowa Humane Society get a little freaked out. It's not every day you see a dog have a kitten for lunch. Grab him, grab the new kitten. And not just a kitten. This dog is about to have a whole litter of kittens for lunch. Uh oh. The story of this unusual dining arrangement began a couple months ago. Lily, a mix of lab and who knows what, was found along an old farm road. She was pregnant and soon had six puppies who all got adopted. And everything was fine until the kittens showed up without a mother. And we didn't know what to do. 
I mean, it, it takes a lot of effort to bottle feed all these kitties. Teresa Kurth works for the shelter and helped come up with the solution. <laughs> you know, there's a big difference between a dog and a cat. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> so we thought, let's just try. Try and see if Lily would have the kittens for lunch, which she did. Breakfast and dinner, too. To see this dog just take to these baby kitties instantly, I just think Lily's one of a kind. Yes and no. There was also the cat who heard an abandoned fawn crying for food and took in the little deerlet. Or how about the baby horse raised by a goat? And perhaps most amazing of all, the leopard, who in killing a baboon unwittingly created an orphan. The leopard could have easily made the baby an appetizer, but instead sat down beside and mothered it. Why would an animal show such grace? Why would Lily, when one of the kittens fell into her water dish, rescue the little troublemaker and carry him off to safety? Why? Other than the obvious. I mean, it's, it's what she does. Indeed, for most mothers, it's just what they do. An instinct so deeply wired into them that often all they know is to love and care for life. Understanding it completely will take scientists many more years. But feel free to appreciate it this weekend. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Burlington, Iowa. So Paul says, we came to you like a substitute mother. You were spiritual orphans, and we came to you like a substitute mother, but with our own children. We didn't, we didn't treat you any differently because you weren't my spiritual child. Uh, we, we came to you and, uh, as, as a parent, and he was willing to get messy, was willing to change those spiritual diapers, willing to do that, that messy work because the nature of the mature is to nurture. Taking on that responsibility is also risky because there's no one who can hurt you like your, your own child if they are going off track. There's no one. When we open ourselves to someone, there's no one that can hurt us like those that we've invested in. So the question, one question that we have to ask ourselves is, am I willing to open myself up to be hurt? Am I willing to open myself up to be disappointed? Over the years, I've had opportunities to do a lot of weddings, and I've had a lot of young couples come to me. And, you know, by the time they get to me and they're ready to be married, they're just all, you know, goo-goo-eyed and rose-colored glasses and just, you know, can't wait. And everything's just so good, you know, and stuff. But I, I as my wife and I have spent time doing pre-marriage mentoring, with a number of these couples. And some of them come in, and I'm so grieved because I see that they really don't have any foundation. And I look especially at these young men who are going to be leading in their homes, and they don't have a lot of spiritual foundation in their life. There are some exceptions to that. But, uh, but some of them, one of them's here, but um, some of them don't have any foundation. And over the years, I've said, you know what, if I, what I would love to do is be able to get a hold of these guys before they get ready to come to, to the altar and, and help disciple them and ground them in some of the basics of life so that by the time they meet a girl, that they're, they're better prepared for, for marriage. And so what I've done over the years is, is started to, to do some young men's discipleship groups. And I've done three or four of those groups now. And so some of those young, young men in there, like it's really great to see the progress they make. And then others, honestly, you open yourselves up, you open yourself up to them and it can be disappointing. There was one young man who, who I've spent a lot of time with and I've met with, you know, one-on-one -on -one for lunch and that kind of thing. And we've worked through his finances, we've done different things. And over the years, I, I, we, we were doing this and I recognized one day, I, I thought, I'm doing all the initiating here. The only time we get together is, is when I initiate that. And I, I thought, this is a next step that he, that he needs to take. And so we had lunch one day. And I just said to him, you know, I, I said, I, I love you. You know I love you. you. We've had you over dinner to our house, that kind of thing. And I said, I, I am willing to spend as much time as you want 
talking about your life, helping you along, whatever I can do for you, I'm, I'm willing to do that. But I said, from this point on, I'm not going to call you and ask for that. I still want to get together, but I'm going to let you, I'm going to let that ball in your court. That was the last time that we did that. I mean, he, he never, he didn't make that step. He wasn't there yet, and, and that was hard for me, but I thought he, he needed to be there. I was nudging him a little bit, and he wasn't there, and that was hard for me, because I'm like, I've invested a lot, and I continue to pray for him. I have seen, I continue to see him, but um, that's hard. You need to know that it's risky if you start investing in someone. People don't always turn out the way we would like for them to, to turn out, and so it takes patience, <clears throat> but it, there, there's a risk involved. Now, you could contrast that to another young man who was also in, in a group with me. And he, he's a, a bodybuilder. He's, like, really, really huge. He didn't learn that part from me, if you saw him. Um, but uh, he, he builds relationships with guys who are younger than him at the gym. And he told me the story of, of someone that he was getting close to, and this young man, this uh, he was a teenager that he met in the gym, was telling him about some, some choices that he was making, some moral choices he was making that was really, it was going to be really negative for his life. And so, so this young man really spoke into his life, encouraged him to do the right thing, and really changed the, the direction, the choices that this guy was making. And so I was like, way to go. That's great. I mean, he was receiving, not, not that he just received from me. He also has a very solid home life. But he, he is receiving good stuff and passing that on to someone else. And you see that and you rejoice in that. You say, this is awesome. This is great. And sometimes you'll have those success stories, but you won't all the time. And so you have to ask yourself, am I willing to deal with the, the risk that things all, always aren't going to pay off the way I might like them to. But here's the thing. God does not call us to be successful, whatever that is defined as. God calls us to be faithful. And so when he brings people into our path and we sense that he is nudging us to take them under our wing, to be nurturing to them, then he's going to take care of the outcome. Leave the outcome in his hands. Only he knows what that's going to be. All I can do is say, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to invest. So let's, let's talk here at the end uh, for, for three actions that we can take to invest in others. What can we be watching for as people come through these doors? The first is to die to self. That, that's really the essence of parenting. If you've been a parent at all, you, you know that. You, you, gotta just, you just got to say, it's not about me anymore. It's not about my fun anymore. It's about investing in, in these people that, that I love, these children, these spiritual children, because it takes a lot of effort to figure out what those screeches mean. It takes a lot of effort to feed someone who is helpless. It takes a lot of effort to train them. It takes a lot of effort to discipline them. I think sometimes my kids think that discipline is the fun part of my job as a parent, because I get to take it all out on them, right? But it's, it's the hardest part of parenting, disciplining, when you see someone you love going off the rails, going off track, and your heart just breaks for them, and you say, how can I help bring them back on track? If you're going to discipline in love, if you're going to discipline for their good, and not just to vent your own frustrations, discipline is the hardest thing, and we have to die to self and say, I'm willing to do that hard work. Uh, the second thing is to, to get involved. It's to say, okay, I'll die to self, and then I'm going to move towards someone else. I'm going to actually jump in. I'm willing to face the mess. I'm willing to take the risk, and I'm going to get involved as the spiritual orphans come through these doors. I'm going to do like Paul did. I'm going to take care of them. <laughs> I'm going to show affection for them. I'm going to share my very self. So let me just get very practical for you and talk about what does that look like as people come through, through your doors. Two things. One, one very basic one is as people come on Sunday morning, just make them feel welcome. Uh, you guys do a good job of that. You have an opportunity here to, to just say hi to them. But say hi to them. Share your name with them. Um, just let them know you're glad they're here. And then, and then here, this is very important, if they come back, 
that's where you really want to ramp it up. You don't want to overwhelm. You don't want to smother people at all. So I'm not recommending that. But I'm saying if you see people come back, then you know that they are hungry. They are hungry for a relationship with Christ, hungry to grow in that, and that they have found something here that is helping meet that need. So then you want to say, let's, how can we take that to a next level? Let's really welcome them back. And let's say, how can you take a next step with us? Maybe there's a Sunday school class you can invite them to. Maybe there's a small group. I know uh, Jim has told me that you guys are going to be getting uh, much more active in terms of having small groups and having those available. So think about, how can I invite someone into a next setting? Or maybe it's as simple as just, can we go to lunch? You know, let's go to lunch after church. People love to eat. So uh, invite them out uh, for lunch. And, and sometimes it's, it's less threatening for someone to have lunch out somewhere than it is to invite them to your home. That's a wonderful thing, too. As you get to know people better, invite them into your home. But sometimes that's a little scary. Like, I don't know you. I mean, you know, what might you do to me once you get, in, get me inside your house? I don't know. So we can go out to some neutral place. And, and just get to know each other a little bit, begin sharing ourselves. And then speaking again about small groups, I know Jim's saying, I mean, his, his vision and the vision of leadership here is to say, we, we want to have a lot of small groups to offer. And so it may be that God is, is calling you to host one of those small groups in your, in your home. And you don't have to be a seminary graduate. You don't have to even be able to teach the Bible. I mean, there are tools and things that, that will be able to be put into your hands to make that doable. Really, the, the biggest job for the host of a small group is just to be hospitable, open your home, and just, just care about these people who are coming in and, and share your very self with them. So some practical ways you can do that. And along with that, I said two, but here's three, sorry, um, to pray pray for people because here's here's what will happen if you if you're not doing this already to begin to pray for these people across the road maybe sometime maybe some of you have opportunity to go over there park your car somewhere and walk walk around those houses and pray for people that you don't even know yet but asking God to move in their hearts, asking God to rescue people who are spiritual orphans. They are without hope in this world. Do you realize? And they are headed for a Christless eternity. Pray for them. Pray for opportunities to be able to reach out and, and touch them. And as you do that, God is going to be at work in your own heart preparing you to be ready for when they come through the door. And then as your heart gets ready, and as you're ready to receive them, he's going to start bringing them through the door because God is looking. God's looking for churches to be places where those spiritual orphans can come and be nurtured by the, the mature. All right, so I said I'm giving you three actions. Okay, the first one is to die to self. The second one is then to act on that, to, to get involved. The third one is to realize, and this is the last one, to realize that you yourself are in process. Okay, so be patient with yourself in this process. There's a, there's a word that gets repeated three times in this passage that we read, and it's hard to see in the English because it gets translated in different ways, but it's the word become. So in verse 7... <clears throat> No, let me, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, in verse 7, he said, we, it, in my version, it says, we were gentle among you. That actually says, we became gentle among you. And then in verse 8, he says, you had become very dear to us. And in verse 10, he says, um, we, we became holy and righteous and blameless. That's actually the way it says it in the Greek. We became that way. See, we are all in process. I think that's the important thing to remember. Even though we may be further down the road than someone else, we may be more mature than them, and we want to help nurture them. You and I are still very much in process. God's still working on us. And there are times for me where I become impatient with those spiritual infants. And, I'm, I, and I have to remind myself where they're at. They may look grown up on the outside. They may actually look pretty good. They may actually clean themselves up pretty well. 
and look like they've got it together, but then they'll do something. I'm like, what? No, where'd that come from? You know? And I have to remind myself, wait a minute. They've, they've turned from idols to the living and true God, and they need to be nurtured and grown up in, in him. And so be patient with yourselves in that process and keep pressing into it to fulfill what God has given you to do. Calvary Bible Church is a very exciting point. Not a lot of opportunity, amazing opportunity, because God is looking for churches who will be welcoming to spiritual orphans and say, we want to come alongside of you. We want to nurture you. We want to be that mature person in your life to help you along to the next step. So the question for you here is, knowing that there's going to be some mess, knowing that there's going to be some, some risk, are you up for it? Are you willing to, to enter into that mess, into that risk? God's looking for those kind of people. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for each person in this room and where they are at spiritually. And I thank you for the work that you do, the, the, the work of grace that you do in each of our lives every, every day to grow us and conform us to the image of Christ. And so I pray, Father, for the mature in, in this room that you will call them to invest in the lives of others and to invest in the lives of those spiritual orphans, to become the substitute spiritual mothers and fathers to people who are coming out of, of worshiping false gods and coming to the living and true God. Lord, make, make this place uh, even more vibrant with the power of your spirit, with the life-giving spirit. Um, Lord, make this a place where young Christians, Christ followers, can grow up and then help a next generation of, of growing up. Lord, we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.